Now we'll move on to the second topic that is about evolution of an HRM. How the HRM is developed over a period of time. If you look at it actually, you know, right from industrial revolution time, uh, there were a lot of activities have been, con you know, performed to find out about HRM related things. And uh, that's the way if you look into it, uh, we can look at the evolution from different, different angle. And uh, they, we can call it as history of the human resource management. Industrial revolution time, actually, you know, uh, that's the first kind of a phase where uh, originally all the machines and production has started and when the machines are brought in the production process rapid progress in technology jobs were more fragmented and specialization increased more and more specialized kind of an activities are started looking at and uh, but uh, you know uh, workers with uh, but, but actually workers have become more dull and uh, they become more in boring monotonous kind of a job and government did very little to protect the interest of the workers. So these are the time actually, you know, uh, people have, uh, what has happened is like, you know, from the workshop type, actually the industrial revolution had happened. When the industrial revolution had happened, more and more machinery has started coming in, more job specialization started happening. And that's the time actually people were routinely put across in the same kind of a job again and again so ultimately by doing it like a mechanical way you know uh, they have been put up put on with boredom and uh, you know monotonous kind of a job and they actually you know become dull and government also did not contribute anything for the development of it so ultimately by doing that what has happened is the uh, people have done an uh, experiment and they understood that we need to create a very good kind of a working condition we cannot do the work in a more haphazard manner. We need to do it in a more systematic manner. And that's where, you know, the birth of a scientific management thing came into picture. That's the second phase of it. In the second phase in the scientific management, to improve the efficiency and the speed, uh, there's a person called F. W. Taylor, who has advocated uh, scientific management uh, in the entire management uh, you know, uh, philosophy. Uh, scientific management is nothing but a systematic analysis and a breakdown of work into a smaller, smaller kind of a mechanical element and rearranged in the most efficient combination. So wherever people are actually, you know, uh, falling in or probably have a sh lacuna of the training, the training can be provided. Wherever the skill uh, gap is there, we can provide the training. So that's the way scientific management was equipping many people. And that way scientific management was put down a lot of boredom and uh, other things and all. But even the scientific management, what has happened is like, uh, you know, people could not actually solve many of the uh, industrial relation problems. And uh, that's where actually, you know, third era where uh, employer and employee, there was a big kind of a gap and employees expectations are something different and employees started forming their own trade unions so workers join hands to protect against the uh, you know exploitive kind of a tendency of an employers and unfair labor practices and that's why trade union try to improve the work conditions pay and benefits disciplinary actions etc so that's why actually you know the third kind of an era people have started understanding that you know if we don't provide the basic kind of a thing the employee will demand it through the you know collective kind of bargaining the next comes your human relations uh, moment where Hawthorne's experiment has been conducted uh, you know El there's a person called Elton Mayo uh, actually you know he was trying to you know do an experiment the productivity you know ultimately what he has found out is the productivity is not dependent on reward and uh, job design but also certain social and psychological factors also that means you know he has he has done a small kind of an experiment called Hawthorne studies where uh, you know all the uh, entire organization have been divided into different different groups each group has been you know asked to work under a different kind of a light intensity and uh, they first found out that whichever uh, group has worked under high light intensity they were performing very well and uh, other low intensity they were you know performing very very below that's what actually they found out they thought that it is because of the light intensity, the performance actually productivity got affected. But originally, they found out that it is not about uh, light intensity and other, you know, working conditions and all. It's all about psychology of the people. And whichever team has been asked to work under a high light intensity, they got highly motivated. They thought that 
their work has been recognized so that's a way actually psychological feeling makes a lot of you know uh, kind of an impact and uh, the third next kind of an approach is your human resource approach uh, during an early 60s uh, pet milk theory that means we need to maintain good relationship with the human uh, you know human resource that is our employees if we maintain a very good kind of an employee relations automatically employee will be very very happy they will produce an you know efficient and effective kind of an you know output so that's the way they came out with and it's something like how happy cows give more milk similar way try to make your employees happy so that you know they will produce they will uh, contribute more so it was actually recognized that workers are unique and have an individual need and we need to you know take care of the individual requirement also the trend actually moved towards treating employees as a resources and yes assert so that kind of a concept has emerged and that's a way if you look into it evolution of hrm way from 1920 to 1930 until 1991 and uh, you know until now so there was a different stages the first stage was providing a welfare benefit, uh, management and the second one is a personal management where uh, you know they were trying to maintain a record and the third one is the development phase where they were providing a training and the next phase is your proactive growth oriented phase where people started accepting human you know human resources as an asset and that's the way if you look into the phases of hrm uh, you have a welfare phase personal management phase development phase and growth oriented phase the welfare phase is actually you know try to maintain the records of an employee such as attendance leave roles welfare administration and you know entire other welfare benefits of it the second kind of a personal management phase is like you know fire uh, fighting role and uh, all the uh, trade union and disputes of an employee has been uh, solved and it has been actually you know uh, they have been acting as a kind of a role of an advisor mediator legal advice or fire fighting and those kind of a thing development phase where importance has been given for an efficiency and effectiveness emphasis on human values dignity and ultimately you know the change agent and training and other things and all and the last phase is about growth oriented phase where employees are considered as an assets and hr managers role actually you know as a developer counselor coach and a mentor and problem solver these are the phases kind of a way actually hrm has been developed over a period of time